It is a privilege to be here. I remember the first time I, uh, one of the first times I came, uh, it was a big snowstorm. We were the last people to land. We did the last plane out of Chicago. And uh, it was just such an anointing here when I stepped in. And I remember asking um, uh, Caleb's dad, who was passionate at the time, Doug, what did you do before I got here? Because that was, that didn't even feel like the United States. That felt like ministering in Brazil. There's this, the, the ease of healing. It was, it was, it was amazing. I still have the video of it. And uh, so it's glad to be back. I think Caleb reminded me last time on Sunday morning, I uh, spoke on impartation. Uh, I want to speak on healing and on, I want to speak on the power of the testimony and, uh, one of the reasons why I've chosen that message is that it actually happened here in Dayton. Uh, the, usually the illustration that I will share, it, it happened here. And I want to share that illustration first and then show you that I'm not off by saying there is power in the testimony to create faith for healing. Because then after we share the, that story, uh, we'll look in the scripture and, and show you it again. Well, then we're going to end up with a ministry team sharing words and knowledge and also the people, some of the young uh, ministers that are traveling with me that I'm mentoring. And um, some, one, of them, one of them, like Dimitri, has his own ministry. He takes teams all over the world for healing, and they see a lot of miracles. It's just an honor to be able to sow into their lives. So um, we're going to have a good ministry time. So I graduated with my doctorate from the seminary here in Dayton, and uh, I was asked to speak at this church, which is an uh, African-American church. And um, I was really um, nervous about it and, uh, because I don't have rhythm. And, <laughs> and, and I didn't know if I could, you know, get in sync. And, but when I got there to preach, I only preached five minutes. And I can tell this is... The wrong sermon. There is no anointing on this sermon. This is not good. So I actually stopped and said, Pastor, I'm sorry, but I don't have the right message. I'm just going to tell some stories of what I'm seeing God do. Now, those people who've heard me preach a lot, they usually giggle when I say that. And I know why they're laughing, because they're thinking, well, what's the difference? <laughs> that's kind of what you do anyway, is tell stories. But... Uh, as I'm telling stories of what I'd seen God do pertaining to healing, um, particularly in Brazil, I felt heat, strong heat come on the top of my foot. I think it was, I don't remember now which left or right, but it was on my foot. And I stopped in the, and just said, I feel heat on the top of my, say, right foot. And, uh, and, and then I just went right on telling the stories. But then, within a few minutes, nobody is listening. Everybody's looking over there to that section over there. And I can preach through about anything because I preached in Toronto the 42 of the first 60 days. Uh, but I can't preach when no one's listening. I just, it, so I just, I just go find out what's going on. And, and I found out, by the way, I just found out something a few months ago that I'd been telling wrong for a long time. So, anyway, I come over here, and down uh, right on the edge of the seat there, it'd be over here, there's this big black guy. I mean, he was big. He was like really, really tall and really, really big. And uh, for years, I told the story that, you know, he played tackle in high school, and, and, uh, and, and, and that's what I would share the story. So, anyway, I went up to him and said, what's going on? Because he's got tears running down his face, just tears. And he said, that's my wife, ask her. So I knelt down on the second row on the end, on this end, and she's sitting um, about where the lady there is, the white, and her husband's got a red cap on. She was, she was sitting right there. And there's a bunch of women around her, and they were all excited, and, and she's crying. And I said, what is going on? And she said, I'm 28 years old. When I was eight years old, I was in a project, housing project. I fell out the window. It broke. I fell through it. And it cut off, pretty much almost cut my whole foot off. It was hanging by like the Achilles tendon. 
and they had to reconstruct my foot and they had to put artificial tendons and since that surgery I have not been able to curl my toes I've not been able to point my foot because you can't do that without those tendons in there and because I can't do that I can't run for 20 years but when you said you felt heat on the top of your foot Instantly, I felt that same heat on the top of my foot. So I tried to curl my toes. And for the first time in 20 years, I could curl my toes. I tried to point my foot, and she did it. I said, I can point my foot. Then she jumped up and ran around the church, and, the, and everybody went kind of crazy. You know, we kind of clap. Caucasians, we clap. This African-American church, they didn't clap. They, this, all, most of the men, they... I mean, I thought, I've never really seen that, but that's really cool. And uh, anyway, what I found out just a few months ago uh, when I was preaching in a black church in Virginia um, with some friends, uh, this guy came up to me. He said, you know, when you tell that story... He was, a, he was a tackle on high school football. That's right. But that was not all he was. He was the tackle for an NF, NFL, was it Bengals or whatever you guys have, either. I don't know. <laughs> and, 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 and this guy said, the moment he, that happened to his wife, I was stationed in Germany in the military, and I knew about it because it went out on social media. And I'm thinking, and, and what's really, really embarrassing so I didn't know him. I didn't know. And, and I, but he and his wife that night got used, and they were used to pray for a person who had lost the ability. He, he got hurt uh, in uh, martial arts, and he had snapped his meniscus in his knee. And when it broke, he hurt it, and he had not been able to squat or do roundhouse kicks or anything. So they prayed for him, and that night, he got healed, and he's up here doing squats and doing roundhouse kicks and all. And I said, well, who prayed for you? And it was this couple. Uh, and God had pointed them out to me and I prayed for them that afternoon in a, in a leadership meeting that God would use them I didn't know but I wanted to make sure they got training I said listen I got this training it's called Christian Healing Certification Program I, I think you guys ought to be in it and, and I've got some books and stuff and listen if you can't afford it <laughs> I'll give them to you I'm thinking, I just told an NFL football player if he can't afford, I, I am so embarrassed. Anyway, I didn't know that until just recently. So, as long as, uh, to get, get to the point. So, that was in here. The next Sunday, I'm in Taipei, Taiwan, and we're doing a large meeting, and I told that story. And after the, uh, the message and ministry, this Chinese man came up on the stage and said, I want to tell you something. The pastor allowed him to come up with his daughter. And he said, this is not my church. We don't go here. This is the first time we've ever been to this church. This morning, as we're driving to our church, when I get in front of this church, the Holy Spirit said, stop here and go here. I'm thinking, oh, I, Why? And he said, I'm not here because you're here, because I don't know who you are, never heard of you, and I did not come here because you're here. I came here because the Holy Spirit said, stop here. Now my, wife, my, my daughter will finish the story. And she said, I'm 28 years old. When I was eight years old, I almost had my foot cut off. And they had to put artificial tendons in it. I've not been able to curl my toes. I've not been able to point my foot. And I've not been able to run for 20 years. But when we came here today and you told that story, I knew I'm about to get healed. And I understood why God told my dad to stop here today. He set this up. It is amazing when God does things to create the gift of faith. She said, when, when you said that, and I heard that, I went outside so I could try to run, and I can run. The power of the testimony created faith. And that's what we're about today. We are going to show um, 
uh, some testimony that hopefully will build a lot of faith and people get healed. But now I, I want to go to the Scripture. You know, I was raised Baptist, went to Baptist college and seminary. <laughs> you, you really don't preach if you don't have any Scripture. You got, you, to be legal, you got to have some Scripture. And I believe that, and I'm not making fun of it. I thank God uh, for the heritage of uh, wanting to honor the, the Word of God and, and teach it for what it really says, bringing out of the text instead of reading into it. So in this first uh, Luke, all, it's going to be four passages on three stories. One of the story will be told both by Luke and Matthew to put it in chronological order because it is important to see the chronological order. Now, I am going to admit, I can't prove to you what I'm saying on the first story. I think it's highly probable, but I, I can prove, in my opinion, prove beyond shadow of a doubt that the power of the testimony brought about a, a huge healing, one of the greatest healing incidents in Jesus' life. We begin Luke chapter 6, verse 17 through 19, and the important verse is verse 19. This is the, where Jesus came down and, uh, and, and he's um, praying on a level place, the plain. He went down from the, with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples w was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coast of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those troubled by evil spirits were cured. And all the people all tried, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming out of him and healing them all. They were trying to touch him because everybody was touching and power was coming out of Jesus and healing them all. I believe that story is what gave faith to the woman who's healed in the next story. Now, I can't prove that, but I believe it. And I believe it's what caused her to even have the idea, if I can only touch him, I'm going to be healed, was the testimony of what happened here on the plane. And it's interesting. People still come to hear Jesus and to be healed and to be delivered uh, from the evil spirits. So the next story is Luke chapter 8, beginning in the middle of verse um, 42. <clears throat> this is the story of the woman with the issue of blood. Probably no part of Scripture has been preached on more about healing than this story. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. One version of this says that she'd spent all of her money on doctors and was no better. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. That's important, that little phrase, the edge of his cloak. And immediately, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, that's what Peter said to him. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling. I think the reason why she couldn't go unnoticed is she was trembling. The power that left Jesus and went into her caused her to tremble, which is quite common, sometimes shaking violently, and, and came and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Now, Luke doesn't tell us what she said. He just, the details, he just makes that general statement. But we can see in Matthew, which we'll turn to next, what she said. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. It is true, her faith healed her. But it's not the full truth. It's true. But it's also in this story, we find that the power that left his body that went into her is what healed her, but what accessed that power was her faith. So it's, it's, it's both is true. But it wasn't like her faith healed her in the way of the new age and some of the secular world, medical world talks about placebo effect. But it was her faith accessed not a naturalistic power of our body, 
But her faith accessed the power of heaven, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that came out of Jesus and went into her and healed her. And in Luke, he mentions that he touched the edge, she touched the edge of his cloak, that little detail, very important. Now, different translation says it different. Some will say his mantle. Some will say the edge of his garment or the hem of his garment. Um, so it's, it's used in different ways, but consistently, it's the same thing in, in the Greek and the different uh, translations. Now, let's go to uh, Matthew uh, chapter 9, verses uh, 20 through 22. This is the same story, but Matthew adds a little bit that Luke didn't. It's a much shorter version. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched, here it is, the edge of his cloak. Both Matthew and Luke give that little detail. She touched the edge of his cloak. And you say, I don't know why you're emphasizing that. Well, hang in there. It is going to become clear in a moment. She she said to herself, this is what Luke didn't tell us, if I can only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Self-talk is really important. And it's important because it's all often the indication of where your expectation is or where your faith is. Often in videos, you'll hear somebody say, who got a major healing in, the, in, our, in our meetings, they'll say, I knew today was going to be my day. Now, the question is, well, how did they know today was going to be their day except that the Lord was putting that in them? The Lord was creating this gift of faith. The Lord was doing things to give them that expectation. And then just focus this is not so much on, 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 on our uh, effort as much as his grace. So when we look at the next passage, and that's in um, Matthew 14. And beginning in verse 34. Now Jesus and the disciples have just come across the sea. They've had a storm. They've had to, um, he had, <laughs> had to take care of that. What I mean, believe, is often right before there's a big breakthrough, there's also a big battle. There's warfare around the, the ministry of Jesus. And there's still warfare. And sometimes when there's a huge break, uh, uh, breakthrough about to come. Matter of fact, the biggest argument, and the, only the second time I ever yelled at my wife that scared our kids, they came down and said, are you guys going to get a divorce? And, no, no. And then I realized, I'm getting ready to go to Toronto tomorrow. This is an unusual response. This is actually a strategy of the enemy to make me feel guilty. This is a strategy of the enemy to try to stop what God, I believe now, he's going to do something in Toronto. And uh, I just wanted to share this. Often, before we have big, big victories, there is a, a spiritual battle. So when we look at this passage, verse 34 of chapter 14 of Matthew, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him, verse 36, and begged. They begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. That is an unusual request. Most commentators don't like this Matthew 14 passage I just read to you. And often they'll say, oh, this is bordering on kind of a superstitious kind of faith. This is not, we really don't, uh, we really think that this is one of the places where it's almost embarrassing. This is not the real quality of faith that we usually would think about. It's, it's connected to doing something. And, and I think, gosh, these guys, these commentators sometimes, I wish they had more experience in praying for the sick I'm glad they know Greek, but I wish they knew what it was like to minister in healing. Sometimes people ask, why do you think they tr uh, translate, or why do they make that, those comments? 
And I think the answer is, for example, in uh, Mark eleven twenty two 22, it says, uh, have faith in God. And most translations say, have faith in God. But it's also just as um, correct, grammatically with Greek, to say, to translate that, have faith of God. And you say, well, why would they translate, most of them translate have faith in God? There's probably over 20, and there's only six in English that says, have the faith of God. It's because most, most uh, translators are really good and highly educated and, and know Greek, but almost none of them have any experience in praying for the sick. So for their worldview, have faith in God makes more sense than have faith of God. But like F.F. F. Bosworth, who was a great, had a great healing anointing in his book on Christ the Healer, first place I read this at, but also I've found it in other places. Have faith of God in context makes more sense if you understand healing. And if you've had those occasions where you go past your faith, and all of a sudden, our faith often, our faith often, no matter what we're saying with our mouth, often our faith is a mixture. We're kind of like the man whose son uh, was demonized and Jesus said all things are possible. He said, if you can do anything, have mercy on in healing. And Jesus said, if I can do anything, all things are possible to him who has faith. And the man says, well, I believe, help my unbelief. And, and a lot of the times, that's where more of us, most of us are at a lot of the times. It's not perfect faith without any doubt. It's more of a mixture. But when we come to that passage, it says if you have faith, or as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 too, it's so if I have all faith, so as to move mountains. He's talking about the gift of faith. The gift of faith, when we are in that gift of faith, we are now experiencing his faith. Yeah. And when we are in that moment, there really isn't any doubt. We can't create that kind of faith. That goes beyond our ability. That, that's, that's just his grace-based faith that he created in the moment, often by revelation of what he wants to do. And, and in that moment, there is, uh, is no doubt. So... Sometimes God will use testimony to create the gift of faith, like the Taipei, Taiwan story. The, the timing of it and how all that had gone on before was very important. Now, I'm going to ask Dimitri to come. He's got three testimonies. He checked with me. He's got three minutes to give three testimonies. He'll have his clock, watch with, clock with him, watch with him, phone with him. And he'll have it on a timer. But he's a mighty man of God. And I wanted you to hear his stories because these are very powerful. Then we're going to have some more testimonies that you're going to hear. And we're going to end with prayer today. And I believe God wants to create faith, taking us beyond our faith into his faith. Yeah, I just... Um... Just wanted to testify to you guys about the faithfulness of God. Um, when I was about nine years old, I was paralyzed on my face, and my parents took me to a bunch of different doctors and uh, hospitals, and the doctors was, were suspecting that it was something that had to do with like uh, my, my emotions and nerves and stuff like that. And so they said that I was too young for any treatment or medication, and they were saying that uh, I was probably, it was just incurable. Um, but I remember when my parents took me to a small little prayer house, and uh, these, these grandmas and grandpas just surrounded me, laid their hands on me, uh, and they started praying over me. And uh, after they prayed over me, you know, during the service, nothing happened. But when we were walking out of the service, this lady ran up to my parents and she said, she was like, hold on, before you guys get in your car and, and leave, she's like, I saw Jesus walk into the building, come up to your child, lay his hands uh, on, his, on my face. And a few days later, I woke up. Every night, they would have to, have to take my eyes shut. A few days later, I woke up, walked up to the mirror, and I ripped the tape off of my eye because one of them was paralyzed open. Uh, and when I ripped it off, my face was completely healed. Jesus healed me completely. Amen. Come on, give it up to Jesus. 
two more quick testimonies. Um, my brother-in-law, he was schizophrenic um, and uh, pretty much his whole life, and it really flared up uh, really badly around uh, 20 years old where he was constantly hallucinating and hearing things. I mean, he was hospitalized and, you know, straight jackets, imprisoned because he, was, he would attack people when it would get really bad, all of this stuff. And I remember we actually brought him to a church in Portland, Oregon, uh, a charismatic church, and uh, a man of God prayed over him and the power of God hit him and he shook like brother Randy shared he just shook under the power of God almost violently and all of his hallucinations ended all of the stuff that he was hearing ended and God healed him completely hallelujah glory Amen. be to God and uh, the third testimony, uh, I have a friend, a pastor friend of mine who had uh, cancer in his spine uh, and it was spreading already uh, all over his body, started going into his prostate. He had difficulty walking and difficulty sitting. And I remember when we uh, visited his house and actually just took an hour of just testifying to him uh, because we remember we heard the message on the power of testimony and we just took a full hour and we just testified stories of just how God healed me and how God healed friends of mine and all of this stuff and then afterwards we just asked him would you give us the permission to lay our hands on you and pray over you and uh, he said yes we laid our hands on him started praying over him and in his own words he said that he almost felt like a wave of heat go through his body and uh, keep in mind he had difficulty sitting and walking uh, three months later he showed up to my friend's youth service and he said that he went to the doctors and they couldn't find a trace of cancer in his body Jesus Christ healed him completely <laughs> hallelujah Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Dimitri. We could go on and on and on telling stories, but it's also good to see them happen. We want to take the next few minutes and we want to show you some of the testimonies of people when they're being healed or right after they were healed. And then after that, we're going to have the ministry team and pastors here and um, ourselves share some words of knowledge and then we're going to pray for you and then if I have to leave because we do have to catch a, a plane I've already talked to Dimitri and and uh, Marcus um, who by the way just hasn't been a Christian that long and he got so touched in January to, at 30 year anniversary of Toronto where we were at that he gave up a six-figure job with to become, and also the ability to become the next president of a, of a company that would be like having a million dollars handed to you. He walked away from it because he wanted to say yes to the call of God on his life. And that's why I'm sowing in to these guys because that's what we've been doing for actually 40 years, but especially the last 30. So I just want you to know, and I said that to say this, they're not here for any ulterior reason other than they love Jesus and they wanted a chance to minister and, 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 and to learn and grow. And so I, I just, I'm attesting to the legitimacy of their lives so that you would, again, the testimony is also important about the person's ministering, not just what God is doing. So let's watch the video.
conhecimento que tem alguém ali com um tumor na região do ventre. E aí eu fui para frente. E o João Vitor, é o tradutor, me introduziu ao apóstolo Randy Clark para orar. E Randy Clark colocou a mão na minha so, ventre e nos meus rins e orou pedindo and cura. And then prayed for healing. Eu senti um calor muito grande heat, a lot of heat. e eu acabei caindo para trás. <laughs> and I fell down on the floor. E eu falei assim, se eu fosse curado, and I said, if I was healed, eu teria esse exame para fazer a contraprova I would have an, a, a, a exam, a test. To prove, dia 19 de setembro, cinco dias depois. Five days later, on September 19, e se eu fosse curado, and if I was healed, eu viria no VOA I would come here at VOA e mostraria to show you os dois resultados. Both results. Before I had cancer, now cancer free. E That's no primeiro cool. aparece os dois tumores, no and rim e no pâncreas. One, shows, like, both tumors. And there's the date up there. August. What is the date? August 25th. 25th. Vocês podem ficar com o papel. And then you can you can keep this if you want to. Oh, wow. Obrigado. Okay. E o outro, o outro exame que foi no dia 19, and then the other cinco test, dias depois, five days later, tá escrito amarelinho aqui, ó. Showing in yellow. Nada no pâncreas Nothing e nada no rim. Nothing was found in your pancreas or in your kidneys. Kidneys. Man. Toda honra e glória para o Senhor Jesus. All the glory, yes. all the glory and honor yes, to Lord. Jesus. Amém. Yes. Fernanda. Fernanda. Okay. When she gets it right. Quando ela é co correto? Quando ela? Correct. Aceitar. Aceitar? Aceitar. 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 Quando ela está a aceitar, you, okay? If she misses, because I want her to know when she is right. Fernanda. 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 Stops Church, uh, Verbo Church in São Paulo, or Guarulhos, and uh, this man just came up to me. His name is Paulo, and he wanted to tell me what happened 
eight years ago, four times. Mm -hmm. And so, Paulo, share. O que, que aconteceu há oito anos atrás? É quando o pastor esteve aqui há oito anos atrás. When, past, when the pastor Rand Park were here eight years ago, eu estava com uma artrite reumatoide crônica. I was suffering with a chronic rheumatoid arthritis. Eu não conseguia me levantar minhas mãos. I wasn't able to raise my hands. E aí eu estava aqui no culto quando ele me deu a palavra de conhecimento. And I was here attending the service when he gave this word of knowledge. Ele começou a orar por cura, é, palavra de conhecimento sobre curas. And then e aí ele parou o tempo. And then he started praying about words of knowledge and then he stopped, stopped for a while. Olhou para um lado, para o outro. To a side, to another place. Aí olhou em minha direção e falou, olha, você que está com artrite reumatoide crônica, levanta as mãos. Then he looked straight where I was and said, hey, you that is suffering with a chronic rheumatoid arthritis, raise your hand. Aí, naquele momento, eu, minha mão não conseguia levantar muito, só levantava até aqui. In that moment, my hand was, I wasn't able to raise my hand completely. It would just go in this position. Quando eu fiz assim, senti meu pescoço queimando. And when I tried to raise my hand, I felt my neck burning. Aí minha mão foi levantando, levantando. And then I was being able to uh, raise my hand. E aí fui curado. And then I was healed. Totalmente curado. Completely healed. Oito anos atrás. Oito anos atrás. Oito anos atrás. Eight years ago. Você se curou completamente, foi curado completamente, curado completamente. Yes. Após é, uns 30 dias eu repeti os exames, os exames não deu mais nada. And 30 days after the meeting, I went to the doctor to do some kind of examinations and so nothing, nothing was there in the examination. I was completely healed. I Amen. Completely healed. Amen. Thank you so much for coming and telling me. Muito obrigado por vir. So he had rheumatoid arthritis. We'd, we'd, we had been seeing uh, psoriatic arthritis, but I hadn't heard it. And this eight years ago, that, and he drove hours to get there for we were going to be at that church for lunch. And the amazing thing for me was his ar rheumatoid arthritis was so bad he couldn't lift his arms. He, all he could do was like, like, like this. He could not do this because of the frozenness of the shoulders and he said because I'd said uh, do you have the arthritis raise your hand he said well I can't but I can do this so when he did this instantly that fire hit the back of his neck and then he could do this instantly when he went back to the doctor they could not find any rheumatoid arthritis in his body or the effect of it from the past it was a real major healing our God still heals emotional mental and physical illness he still is doing it he can do it today yesterday last night I mean I think it was like close to 140 healings were recorded in the meeting uh, last night including people who've been healed of metal in their body um, one person had set six screws for seven years or seven screws for six I forget which and God um, healed it and it was, I, uh, was it a woman was, wasn't it it was a woman six screws. six screws seven years but what she couldn't do she said I, I, she couldn't turn her body I don't think I can turn I mean she said I couldn't do this and she went more than I can and was looking like that and, then, and I couldn't do this and she's looking instantly this is the power of God healed her so now what we want to do is to begin to give words of knowledge from your ministry team and from these guys uh, about conditions that we feel God is saying, I want to heal these. And when we understand that the, you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 said, uh, um, the, when the promises of God are not yes and no, they're yes. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God and there's something about not only individual faith but corporate faith so I really want to challenge you not to just be listening for a word for you but listening to the words for your brothers and sisters in this congregation your one body that you want to be stay engaged 
even if this word is not for you, but you want to add your amen, because it's a plural amen. So the amen is spoken not by me, but by us, to the glory of God. And the way God receives glory is by what he does. And when he finds that a greater uh, corporate faith, where we're, where we're not so individualistic, and the Bible's much more about the company of believers, the, the, you know, the, the, the corporate uh, corporateness we're one body and we belong to each other more will happen so father I pray in the name of Jesus as the ministry team comes forward from the church uh, that you would just release your words and you'd release faith and there would be a uh, uh, a being focused in an, in an amen spoken on behalf of the people that are here to say yes God let it be